Hey folks, Coach Patrick here, George Nation, back with another video cast podcast. And in this episode, I'll be talking to you about cramming for your next cycling camp because that's what I just did before we made our epic trip to Mallorca, our annual pilgrimage to go out and adventure, to check out what's happening, to have a chance to build some incredible fitness, make some new friends, and just have a ton of fun, right? It's always good to unplug. It's a privilege to be able to go, uh, but strangely affordable and an opportunity for others to do it. I hope you join us. That's at mile18inc.com. That's mile18inc.com. You can go ahead and make your deposit for the 2023 season already. It is up. It is live. And people do put in those deposits early. Fully refundable, but certainly worth your time. But I'm not here to sell camps. I'm here to talk about cramming for camps and what it means. So quick backdrop for you. I uh, went to Arizona for our spring camp. Which I'm not hyping up to you right now, but was amazing with 20 of our teammates. Uh, and it was a clear indication for me that while I've been doing a fair amount of training over the winter months, since I really haven't had a race in recent memory, I really haven't felt the pressure, the urgency to do something big. In past years, I'd done in uh, March, I did a virtual Everest, 10 hour ride roughly on Zwift. So I've been training for that in the past, but this year, not so much. So I needed something to kind of get me going. And I got to, um, uh, uh, Arizona. And all of a sudden I realized like, Oh, um, body composition, high fitness, low. And sort of that intersection or rather lack thereof put me in a position where I was saying to myself, mm, going to Mallorca in a couple of weeks, want to have fun. Don't want to win anything. It's just sort of riding with yourself, but want to be fit, want to be competent, want to be able to put in work, you know, be a good teammate, be able to ride on the front, uh, be able to support, climb, do all the good stuff, have fun. Um, and realized that I wasn't quite there yet. So hatched a plan with Matt, um, who works with me inside Endurance Station, and I came up with a plan to kind of get me going. But there's a couple of lessons learned that I want to share with you today, but we'll certainly start with the plan. That's the easiest to do. I'll kind of go with that. So I'll put that up here on the screen so you can see it here as well. Boom, there we go. All right, so this is a six-week progression that I did, so predominantly cycling-focused. There were sort of two versions of it. Um, at the top version here, you see that was the initial outlying version, um, which is saying across seven days, what do I do? You know, day of the week agnostic because who knows when you'll start, but give a good sense. Um, and that was mostly um, cycling-oriented. And then uh, version two was a little different uh, depending on what my week held. It turned out that Saturdays, or my day six is according to this document, ended up being a little funky in terms of how things laid out. Often had time to, or requirements to go watch my daughter play volleyball. Uh, and as a result, like Saturday ended up being one of the sort of swing days. So I sort of had two versions of how I wanted to handle things. And this is my option for both. But what you see here essentially is first day, um, put in some quality work or rest, right? So if I'm feeling good, get after it, do some short, hard stuff, some VO2 type work or rest if you're just not feeling it after the end of the week before. Um, then what you'll see here is three days of split sessions. Easy, easy. So 90 minutes in the morning, 90 minutes in the afternoon or evening. Um, then tempo, tempo, uh, which would be sort of zone three work or ABP, always be pushing work if you call it here inside the team. Uh, do that in the morning and the afternoon. That turned out to be about an hour to maybe an hour and 15 in the morning. Um, and then in the evening, it was typically about half an hour is about all I could muster with my schedule. Um, then day four was 90-90. Um, and that, again, was more steady than easy. So it wasn't super easy. Easy was easy. Um, day four was a little more steady work, if you want to call it sort of more zone two type work instead of zone one. Day five was a low cadence day, typically one session. Um, and thank goodness, after those three days. And this case was lower cadence in the 60 to 65 RPM range. I do it seated standing and do some time on and off. I do five minutes on, five minutes off, or six minutes on, four minutes off. And just have an opportunity to kind of work through some low cadence, recruit different motor units, challenge myself differently, et cetera. Uh, the weekend, hopefully, is my hang on ride with some additional work. Um, hang on ride being our 605 a.m. East Coast time quality session that starts off in this progressive climbs and then finishes the 20 kilometer race or about 25 minute race. Um, and then long run. Uh, so keeping my long run, I still plan to keep my long run somewhere in the neighborhood about 10 miles. Um, and so that's been a great opportunity for me to do that as well. So I included that. Uh, and then the version below that has different versions. But the key important parts here in the takeaway, and I'm going to pull this slide away. So you're just going to focus on me. So you don't keep reading those letters. Uh, were the two a day sessions. And the reason why I went to two days was because I knew I needed to get the volume up, but I was concerned about doing that volume always in the morning always doing the volume in the morning and I can hit that alarm clock and get up and anytime, no worries. But there were consequences to that long-term in terms of my ability to function throughout the day, but also 
um, insanely accumulated fatigue. So um, while it's logistically challenging to do two 90 minute sessions a day, it was better for me long term, physiologically, professionally, <laughs> interpersonally to break it up into two blocks because otherwise I'd get up early, get the work done, but be exhausted, like hardcore exhausted in the morning. And really, that's my optimal window for getting stuff done between eight and 10, maybe eight and 11 on a good day. I crush it. Beyond that, I'm getting stuff done and I'm moving things around, but I'm not really crushing it as much as I can. So those bigger days come with a cost in my most important and productive window. I wanted to protect that as much as possible. So that's a good example for you there. But let's talk a little bit more about what are some of the other elements you can control as you cram for an excellent cycling camp. So in addition to that cram training plan, which I just showed you, for those of you got to check out the video, head over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Endurance Nation to check that out. Or obviously here on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Endurance Nation. Uh, the second piece is your equipment choices. So a lot of times when you're traveling or going to a camp, you may decide to make compromises with your equipment simply because of logistics, uh, because of traveling, or maybe you're just concerned about the, your valuables, right? You may not travel well, may not do well, or you may not know your equipment very well. But I will say that having a high quality bike makes a big difference at a cycling camp. So for me, because I'm going to Mallorca, I'm renting a bike, rented a Pinarello this time, first time on a Pinarello, loved it. Um, really stiff, really light, a responsive, etc. I went with DI2 this time, so I kind of splurged. In that case, I think it ended up being $350 for seven days of riding, 50 bucks a day. For me, totally worth it not to have to deal with it. And honestly, flying there and back with the bike would have been some modicum of cost as well, which just adds to a bit of a headache. So I'm really glad that I didn't have to deal with it, especially with some of those longer airport transfers. So high quality machine, super important. Next piece, have a power meter or a heart rate monitor because you want to be able to measure effort. Me, I have a power meter in the pedals. I've got the old P1 pedals easy for me to travel with, and I can take those and then know the effort that I'm at. Similarly, as you're training across a multiple day session of a camp or, or volume camp, like we were at Mallorca, you want to have the ability to categorize or quantify the efforts that you're putting out on a daily basis. Some days you want to be strong, some days not, some days you don't have choices, what you will do. Uh, and when you do that uh, moving forward, it allows you to be proactive and be in charge. You sort of be able to make decisions that stack upon one another, almost like putting up different pieces of the puzzle together because you can see the puzzle pieces. Not having the ability to quantify your effort, power meter, or heart rate monitor just means you're assembling something, but you're blindfolded and you can't see what it is until you're done. And then you're like, ooh, not quite what I intended, right? All right, next piece, ride pacing. And to me, this is super important. Um, it's easy to be excited, particularly in those early days. And I made this mistake myself this year as well. That when you're riding at a camp and when you're getting out there and riding, the number one thing you don't want to miss is the warm up. It's super tempting. I'm outside. Life is good. Shorts on, you know, just a cycling jersey. Let's go. Um, but really, those first 30 minutes make a big difference. And if you don't take the time to kind of get in directly in a sort of a, um, intentional way, you can really set yourself back. So really take the first 30 minutes and, and chill out, sit in the back of the group, work through, talk to people, um, or just take it easy, general, whatever it is, but really warm up, take your time. And you may need to go longer. If you're tired later in the week, take more time, just give yourself some flexibility in that space. Set a cap for your effort. Here's another important one. So put a, put a target out there. I'm going to ride up to 280 or I'm going to ride up to 200 or whatever those numbers are, this hard and, and stop it there. You could ride harder, sure, but we're putting together days. We're building volume across time. The consistency matters in any place where we have this big outlier in terms of effort or strain that we're going to have a commensurate dip, whether it's intentional or not, it's going to be there because we can't handle all of that consecutive work. So really setting those caps is an easy way to make sure that you're good. You know, and give yourself time. If you say, hey, I want a, a part of every ride to do something fun, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, give yourself a target, get after it every time, have fun with it. I'm not trying to ruin your ride, be a party pooper. But I do want you to have a sense of staying within yourself so we can put those days together. And then remember that stops to your friend. Like when you're doing these longer rides, there's plenty of time to break. We're not trying to cram in a session between work. We're not trying to get back for an appointment. This is a camp. You get to ride. So enjoy those breaks. Make the most of them. Do them right. Don't rush through them. Get the nutrition you need. Take the time and re-energize yourself. If you do the proper break and you get it, the timing just right, you can easily move from a quality two-hour, three-hour start to your day and then do another two hours of the backside because you had that great rest block. Without that rest block, you may get four hours out of it, but you'll lose that last hour. So strategic rest breaks do make a big difference for you, right? All right, the next piece, ride and nutrition. And I'm always talking about this. Camp's a little different because you're obviously traveling in nutrition, which is crazy heavy and expensive to take with you, or you're using some kind of nutrition onsite as well. Either way, nutrition really, really matters. So here's the things that we want to think about. Number one, hydration matters. On the ride, you should want to pee about every two to three hours if you're drinking properly. 
if you're not drinking enough, you're going to be dehydrated. <clears throat> the compounding effects of dehydration are actually pretty significant. It can easily sneak up on you. So avoid that scenario by all costs. Make sure you have at least two bottles on you that you're also drinking when you stop at various places when you're refilling. Okay. Uh, second part here on ride nutrition is consistent calorie consumption. Just chomp, chomp, chomp. If you're riding and you're riding long, in our case in Mallorca, we're riding five to six hours a day for about five straight, six to eight straight days. That means I'm eating all the time. Like every half hour, I'm eating something. Even in the first start of the ride, I eat on the 15s and the 45. So 15 minutes in, I'm eating something. 45 minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes. I can see it on the clock on my computer. Just eat, eat, eat. It makes a big difference going forward. And it's important for you to get in the habit of eating. And the habit is actually what sustains you. If you can eat consistently over the course of a big bike camp, you're going to avoid all of those downturns where we just run out of blood sugar we're just low on glycogen and we're just just sort of out of it mentally and then possibly even physically we just have this wasted time and even worse yet downstream negative consequences for being poor with your nutrition later on with your recovery um, and then finally again like before take advantage of those breaks like really refuel like take a good hard look at it. it's a chance to check your bottles am i drinking enough check your food have i eaten enough if you haven't drink and eat now that's what the break is for this is your mid-ride opportunity to catch up and use it strategically. If you are worried about your fitness, you have to crush this stuff. Super, super important. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Now we move on to ride recovery. And these are the last two points for this part, which I think are really, really important. Um, we have two types of recovery. You have post-ride recovery. And then we just have sort of just recovery between the days, between the rides. All right. So post-ride, obviously protein, chocolate milk. You want to get something in if you have a bar. You've got something you can drink, whatever it is. Make sure you're also rehydrated. If it's been a while since you peed or you can actually weigh yourself and see how much body... Um, percentage of body weight that you've lost, you know, anything more than one or 2% body weight lost is an opportunity for you to re replenish that and do that very well. Uh, you want to shower and get those legs up, get, like get clean, get those dirty, wet clothes off your body, just bad for your skin, just bad overall, get clean and get those legs up, start that recovery process right away. If you're able to take a nap, if you have had too much caffeine, you're not too amped up, take that nap, take care of yourself. Uh, and then finally, the hydration piece, like just continue sipping fluids, etc. More often than that, we have a craving for calories, but a lot of times it's actually related to the hydration side. So start with that hydration first, especially if you're trying to be mindful of the calorie side, really make sure you get that hydration and take care of yourself. All right. And then the between ride recovery. And this is the part people miss out on. In a normal day, you do post ride recovery and you're good because tomorrow is another day. When you're at a cycling camp, it's important to think about the blocks of time you're putting together. And as such, really, when you're doing, you know, just 20 or 18 or 16 hours between big rides, then you really have to start thinking about how am I feeling myself for that next ride and not in the breakfast before and go out with a full stomach that feels like a, you know, a kettle inside your belly, but rather the dinner the night before becomes really important. So make good dinner choices, get those carbohydrates in and glycogen, whether it's bread or if you're gluten-free, gluten-free bread, gluten-free pasta, get pasta done, carbs, potatoes, um, anything where you can kind of get some of those calories and you know your body can use will be super helpful over time. Limit the alcohol. Um, as fun as camp is, there's going to be some time to go out and have fun. Really be smart about it, especially depending on how um, how much your body responds to or is affected by alcohol. Have that beer, do it if you want, do it earlier in the evening um, or that glass of wine, but be mindful. If you overdo it, it is going to not only impact tomorrow, but potentially one or two more days down the road, simply because you're just so sensitive to it in that generally dehydrated and depleted state that you're in. Um, and then finally, take time after dinner to do a nice walk, you know, 20, 30 minute, 40 minute walk, catch up, tell stories, meet someone new at the training camp, explore some new area, go walk and get a yummy dessert or something different, but uh, get out and walk about. Um, it's another opportunity for us to kind of stretch our legs at the end of the day before we lay down. It also, in some cases, especially if you're particularly wound up, also operates as a, an additional cool down cycle, help, you know, to sort of flush the legs a little bit, get your body back and get you settled down is important. So if you're going to a training camp, a cycling training camp, and you haven't had the perfect training, don't worry. Six weeks is all you need. You've seen my training plan, and I've talked through the steps, equipment, nutrition strategies, and execution strategies you need to be successful over the course of those six days. I hope this is helpful to you. I hope you find a cycling camp or adventure place that you want to be at. Please do share it with us if you do. Otherwise, go to Mile 18 Inc. That's mile18inc.com. Check out our camps and adventures. See if there's something that matches you, and maybe, who knows, we'll ride together. All right? I'll be sure to walk nicely with you after dinner and we'll get that gelato. Take care, everyone. I'll see you in the next podcast.